Okay, I'm trying again, guys. Bye, bye. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, so I will type over here. Okay, trying again, trying again. Uh, all right, so my bad. Um, again, it's always one little button. Welcome to Sunday night, everybody. I have a great show for you tonight, and I am super sorry about the little hiccup there. But um, I am, uh, it's worth it. I have two cases that are going to teach you some awesome, um, some awesome teachable moments. There is nothing like a patient case that gets me excited to teach, but also it, it is just true. Uh, I have uh, keto coaching and keto teaching that I do all day long every day. And so sometimes it's hard to think about uh, what it is that you don't know. And then it's like a gift from God. Patients write in a story, or not patients, just folks saying, what would you do in this story? And oh, they're just great teachable moments. So I want to just say thank you ahead of time to the two people that are going to be on the show tonight. Uh, their identities will stay uh, hidden, but their stories are super, uh, super important uh, because they're real, they're you. Uh, and it is the wonderful uh, surprise of teaching throughout the world that has been my gift in 2019. Uh, last year at this time, I think I was somewhere around 75,000 subscribers. I'm just about to hit 200,000. So give the video a thumbs up, that would be great. And share this, so we, we need about 400 more subscribers and we hit the 200,000 mark. Um, but that is uh, just a testimony to what happens when uh, you have some good education and some very important and poignant uh, health problems that don't just affect um, you. They are in, in your schools, in your churches, in your streets. Uh, and as soon as you start to feel well, uh, you will find uh, that your neighbor <laughs> should learn about this. Uh, spreading that word has been something that I never planned on uh, two and a half years ago when I wrote this book, Any Way You Can, for my mom. Uh, it was about my mom and teaching her the steps to improve her health when she was ready to choose the grave. And she is, um, uh, I just passed 200,000. Thank you, Edward, for telling that. That's awesome. All right, praise. That is so awesome. Well, all right, so we are going to get started tonight. Um, I do have a, a great topic tonight, which is how do you push restart? Uh, what a perfect time of the year to talk about this. And I have a couple of cases that say, I am not about just a, uh, a, a flighty uh, um, touch of keto, but keto for life, ketones for life. Um, as I look at uh, my goals for 2020, I have a few of them that I'll share with you. Um, one of them is I do this, one of my favorite teaching uh, seminars is a about 12 hour workshop where the Department of Defense actually has hired me to teach some of the first responders about brains and how do you heal them, what happens when they get addicted, what happens when they've been injured, and what happens if they're aging inappropriately. Uh, what can we do to repair a brain? So I really find this, uh, the audience of that to be um, uh, something that coaches have been, it's like my goal that a hundred coaches come to my seminar. It's 12 hours, so it's really hard for coaches to sit still that long. They're very busy people. But that's my, one of my 2020 goals is to have a hundred coaches attend that workshop. Um, but I also have uh, a couple of things that I am going to do in 2020. One of them is I've, I've been writing a book for about a year now and I'm getting into that final edits, or the second edit, third edit, hoping to hit this in first quarter. But as I test out that information, I am going to be doing a few things online, which is in line with the message I'm, I'm writing about in this book, which is, how do, you, how do you do keto consistently? How do you stay keto? Uh, and with all of the uh, um, chatter about not being sustainable, uh, keto being too difficult to do, uh, I like to show how we do it in, in my community and what I do as a part of that. Uh, there is going to be a very detailed workbook that goes with this. So as people work through their own uh, struggles, it can be something you take into your physician and really help you help them uh, keep keep you on the in the path of improving. So uh, look forward to that course here in the next couple of months. There will be um, a live interaction audience for the first uh 
first layer of that course, and I'm super excited about it because it will give me a chance to test out uh, some of the information that I've been writing about. And sometimes when you write and you don't share it with anybody, <laughs> it looks great. And then um, it, it, you deliver it and it kind of falls flat. So I'm really looking at feedback for that, just like I do on these. So thank you for tuning in. Um, I do a couple of things every Sunday night. One of them is check my own sugars and my own ketones. I do this to give you a, a chance to um, a chance to see that yes, I am human and my sugars aren't always perfect. Like sometimes they're at a hundred because things like oh, I forgot to push the 720 alignment when I went to go live, and um, yeah, my computer will only do what I tell it to. So if I don't tell it to do that, it's not going to do it. All right, so I'm going to poke my finger, give you a, a ketone and a glucose reading and it's going to be really important as I walk through these a couple of cases that you kind of just see points of reference. If you haven't started checking your blood sugar, blood ketones, it is not mandatory, but boy, if you run into troubles, it really saves you from kind of hanging out in the ditch, not getting any effects, stalling out on weight loss. Um, numbers are the best teachable moment. So yeah, my, <laughs> my stress poked right up. Uh, that 109 is uh, my blood sugar, still counting down on those ketones. This is real and live. So oh, 1.0, that's not bad for me. I've been keto adapted for a while and this is, I haven't uh, had any supplemental ketones uh, for a couple of days, um, probably about maybe since last Sunday. No, I think I had some on about Thursday or Friday. So that uh, will be something I compare to at the end of the show. Uh, today, I am actually gonna use Keto Combo, which has both BHB and the C8C10. And mainly that's because on the show, we're gonna talk about a patient who uh, is gonna need a little help. And I'm gonna try to talk about the differences in the two types of supplements that I would do if this patient was, if this person was my patient. All right, so I am gonna remind you, this is an educational video. This is not a substitute for your health. You do need to have um, a physician relationship. And I have had some awesome uh, collegial phone calls and consults to say, what would I do in this situation? Uh, and then help that physician just uh, use the ketogenic uh, chemistry to improve a patient's profile. So uh, let's get started. I am going to um, go to this uh, scroll. We're actually going to pull that uh, off here. And we are going to um, actually, I'm going to go back here. Hold on. I have to find my keynote. Oh, here it is. Uh, and there we go. <laughs> okay, and here we have this. Now it should work. <laughs> okay, so uh, keynote turn on. There we go. All right, so we are talking tonight about how to start over. And uh, I am very excited to share with you that there are a couple of stories. We have two stories tonight. One is uh, by Jim, who is 81 years old. And another one, uh, I just got a text back from her saying I could use her name and uh, I think I remember it, but I'm gonna call her Nana from Alabama because that's what's on my screen and I won't have to think about that uh, and call her the wrong name. Um, but uh, again, these folks have uh, been doing a keto for a while and I'm gonna read you a little bit about their story as I um, go through um, their, let's see here. All right, so I am going to read you about Jim. Jim uh, is uh, 81 years old, has an education uh, major, and I think um, uh, a master's in theology. But he talks about his history of being a teacher, uh, really being involved in his community, and he says he's been married to Kay for 120 years. Uh, and then he further explains that he's been married to her for 60 years and she's been married to him for 60 years. <laughs> Congratulations, those are rare finds these days. Uh, I am gonna take a second for a drink. His wife Kay is a nurse and um, they're from the Midwest as well. Uh, she and um, Jim and Kay live in Kansas. So he writes about his keto story and says, I first became interested in the keto lifestyle when they were looking into what the University of Kansas Missouri Center, I think that's what that UKMC stands for, um, 
when they were researching Alzheimer's and how the ketogenic diet might be helping in that. Uh, the report was uh, kind of leading to some of the data that says we might be able to slow down the process of Alzheimer's. This is something that both Kay and Jim have been concerned about with family histories of that. Um, uh, Jim goes on to say that I have been overweight my whole life. Since the age of two, I weighed as much as my sister who was six, year, at, who was six years old. Somewhere around a, uh, age 15 or 20, he topped out at 271, so always has had a struggle with his weight. Five years ago, he was about 237 pounds. In January 2018, he was 223. He hadn't met keto yet. <laughs> he had not been introduced yet. Um, let uh, me just uh, skip down and give you a brief introduction uh, to Nana. Again, she's from Alabama. She's been following uh, the channel for a while. Uh, she is 65 and has read the book, uh, listened to the audio, really enjoyed how much uh, she connected with the story of, um, she describes herself as a, a successful businesswoman, does some mission work in her community and uh, abroad, and has a very active church that she's involved with. Four grown children, and she connects with saying, I might not be Mary Poppins, but I am a Nana to five grandkiddos, ages 15, 13, 12, eight, and three. And I loved your mom's story. I want to be Mary Poppins too. And she goes on to talk about how her health has been pretty amazing. She grew up on a farm, really had, has on no medications, doesn't need antibiotics, uh, successfully runs her business and leads her community. Um, blood pressure is in the 100 to, 110s over 60s, so good blood pressure, good pulse, sleeps well, um, and she must study her sleep because she says, I even get a couple hours of REM a night. Uh, she did grow up uh, on a family farm, and uh, but she also, much like Jim, has struggled with her weight since the age of about mid-teens, so I would think of that as around puberty, 13 years old. Uh, she really says that has been a difficult part of my history. Um, my mom was overweight. She also suffered from depression, deri actually died of cirrhosis. Uh, and as a physician, the first thing I worry about is alcoholism, but she says, no, it was from prescription medications and an excessive amount of um, just medical needs in addition to being overweight. Uh, so probably a history of uh, fatty liver, uh, which we talk about on this channel. She was 80, but she was not a healthy 80. Um, her dad died suddenly at the age of 62 from a heart attack, uh, and weight has been something she struggled with uh, time and time again. She's tried every diet, um, she, everything from injections to pills, but really only losing about 10 pounds. Uh, we're going to talk about her story a little bit more after I do some introductions on um, how, uh, how I think of some of the places I like patients to check in on when they've fallen off the wagon. So when people come in and say, how do I push restart? How do I get back on the ketogenic diet? The first thing I like to point out is this natural trend that you find when you are on a ketogenic diet. I'm just gonna make sure that the comments aren't uh, finding any problems as I'm this far into the video, but it looks like, um, yeah, we're good. Everybody hears me and it's going good. So I'm gonna go over to the button that I can't see any, <laughs> any feedback uh, and just do a, uh, a few um, moments here. Yikes. Um, here we go. Mm. All right, so I like um, uh, folks to say, find uh, the step you're on. Uh, and this is again, when people have run into uh, the, uh, the struggles on a ketogenic diet. I just better check something one, one second here to make sure I put that on the right screen. Oh yeah, I was doing it right, okay. Okay, let me just, forgive me for that one. Just double checking is better than talking to myself for the next five minutes. So find what step they're on. And again, as I've been writing the chapters of this book saying, how can you say, all right, I did for, well for a while, I fell off. Uh, and I really need uh, help getting either to the next level or back on this game again. What I like folks to do is to look at what step they're on. These are the natural steps that I see as patients learn about a ketogenic diet, and then they march through uh, to uh, one of these steps. 
So this is really tiny writing, but hang in there. The first phase that we see people at is they eat every couple of hours. Uh, two to four hours is very common before the ketogenic diet. Once we, if you've read the book, I talk about lowering carbs to 20 uh, or less per day. Uh, but, and within 10 days of doing that, uh, they start to eat uh, further apart. Even if you say nothing to them, uh, if I teach them about this, they kind of watch for it. And some people resist it. They're like, no, 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 I've always eaten this way. And I'm like, try to just listen to your body. But what naturally happens when you go from a high carbohydrate or a standard American diet to a ketogenic diet is the satiety is much, it's much stronger and your, your hunger really is less. It is about a six to eight interval that they go between meals and um, it, it sets in about the second week. Now, some people never get out of this next phase and I've learned that is a sign they're probably not keto adapted. Uh, this number three, I love listening for this in my support group. As we go around and we talk about some of the highs or lows that we've had over the week of keto, uh, this past couple of weeks, we talked about temptations and some of the ways to say no to temptations and then some of those people that sabotage you. Um, so there was um, a few folks that accidentally miss a meal. And when they say that in group, my brain instantly says, oh, they're keto adapted. And what that means chemically is your liver is producing ketones um, every day, every day. Uh, that production of ketones is a supply from fat. When you first go on the ketogenic diet, when you first go from a standard American diet to the ketogenic diet, you really can't make that level of ketones um, steadily. You'll kind of do it in waves. Um, that system is very used to burning glucose. Those first few days, we really like those carbs to actually be as close to zero as you can get them. I say 20 or less because people are figuring out what is a carbohydrate. Um, but the longer you're on the ketogenic diet, that becomes this easy thing where you now understand that has carbohydrates in it and that doesn't. Uh, but if they can go to zero, uh, they, they start producing a trickle of ketones. And not until about that sixth, seventh, eighth day do you start to see that they are producing a steady amount. It takes an even more uh, robust level of ketones in your circulation to suppress the appetite where one day they say, you know, we went to the ER, I have this problem. That would be my story, I'm sorry. We, <laughs> I got taken to the ER, uh, got distracted, had a busy day, and really forgot to eat. Um, I'll tell you, before the ketogenic diet, it would only be on a rare time in the last decade that I would have forgotten to eat. I find that that you know, patients that forget to eat, I would have significant cause to think about prior to studying the ketogenic diet. Standard American diet, that is not normal to forget to eat. Those cravings for food show up every two to four hours. Uh, the next phase that I ask patients to go to after they say, gosh, you know, for the first time in my life, I missed a meal and I didn't even notice, the next thing I ask them to do is plan for that. Go to step four, which is reduce your, your meals to twice a day and make that your option. This is gonna be really important when we talk about Jim's story in a minute. Um, twice, a, twice a day meals are not that uncommon. If you go back over the history of mankind, twice a day meals are not. Uh, three times a day is our American traditional standard, but I would contend that that's probably not evolutionarily the best way for us as adults to eat. So once they get to uh, keto adapted, I push them to say, plan to only eat two. The next step that I ask them to do is that they push all of their calories, so those two meals, to happen within an eight hour window. Now this is not always easy for patients. This can really be unsettling for them at first to say, how do I put them all in eight windows? Uh, for the first time as I'm walking through rules and, and behaviors, uh, I'll talk about calories. Usually I've not talked about calories to this point. And in the timeline of patients, this is usually at the end of that first month or maybe between the first and second month of being keto. I tell them that if you have bulletproof coffee, that's great, but that's the beginning of your eight hours of eating. Uh, those are calories going in, and we don't talk a lot about calories here. I don't want you to get too distracted by them, but when you do a 16-8, all of the calories and all of the sweeteners 
go into the eight hours, and 16 hours of the day is spent without any calories, just salt and water. So um, this, this was difficult for me too. I was a huge cream in my coffee kind of gal, and uh, so that, that first uh, hour of eating was always when I got up and had my cup of coffee. Uh, the next step that I like folks to go to is to make their morning drink, whatever that is that they drink in the morning, calorie free and sweetener free. So the coffee becomes black, the tea becomes black. And <laughs> I will be honest, this sounds like a horrible idea if you're new to keto. I was probably a year into keto before I was willing to say, okay, I could probably go without that that cream in, in the coffee in the morning. Part of it was this comfort of taste. I love the, the taste of it. Um, but honestly, there's some really good coffees out there that I now have learned to love that too. Uh, you will train your palate. I have a couple of really good stories that end up in the book about training your palate versus those that refuse to train their palate. You will adapt. Uh, <laughs> as we go, those are the first six um, uh, steps. But the seventh step gets into, this is going to be really important when we talk about Jim's story in a minute. We have something called OMAD, and if you haven't heard of that, it stands for one meal a day. What I like patients to also think about is I've had people on OMAD, and they're a 24, meaning they have 20 hours of the day that they're fasting, and four hours of the day when they're eating, but they call it OMAD. And so I want you to be careful that OMAD in my chemistry book is about one meal and it should not take you more than an hour to eat that meal. So OMAD, one meal a day, means all of those calories sneak in between that one hour. So that means black coffee before this, uh, fasting teas are really important during this time. Um, there's no bone broth during the rest of it. I'm telling you that has calories in it. Keep that out of your 23 hours, put them into the one hour. Now. It doesn't mean you have to do this, but when you're really reaching to, to perfect the skill, one meal a day gets as limited into that one hour of feeding time as possible. Um, I have lots of people that eat one meal a day. I have a patient, Jerry, who does a great job, has had some really great teachable moments, patients writing in saying, Jerry's case has taught me so much. And Jerry has one meal every other day and the rest of the time, he has a small amount of bone broth that's really salty. And again, that's really important for Jerry. Jerry checks his numbers before and after he does that, and we know that he doesn't have much of an insulin response to that small amount of bone broth. He is very uh, conscious to make it a salty, salty broth, and that's also important for Jerry's um, health as well. All right, so the next level, again, you're trying to figure out where are you at or when you fell off of the keto wagon, where did you end up at? Because number eight is what I call advanced OMAD. Now, I've had people say, I think her OMAD, where you only get one hour to put the calories in, is already advanced. But the super advanced, if you would, OMAD is 23 and one, meaning 23 hours of the day, there are no calories. One hour of the day is where the calories come from. Um, but you have to have also no calories 12 hours before sunrise. So this is important uh, as you look at the chemistry and what's happening with most people who've been overweight for a long time. The two patients, that are, the two people that I'm gonna talk about on the show tonight both have morning sugars that are elevated. Uh, they're not awful, but they're enough elevated that I know the morning cortisol is acting like a meal. So their brain signals that the sun is about to rise and it sends cortisol from their uh, pituitary gland to their liver. As that signal gets to the liver, the liver is so full of stored sugar that so much sugar comes out of storage that you don't have to eat a bite. There is enough sugar in your blood to count as a meal. And that's why this advanced OMAD is super important to figure out that you put all of those, all of those calories into one hour of day uh, and that you also clean up that your, you pick the hour of the day that you're gonna eat, starts at sunrise and needs to be done by the time uh, 12 hours is up. So there's a 12 hour um, uh, zone before sunrise. So sunrise here is about six o'clock. Um, so that would be six o'clock, there is no calories that go in. 
I think this is very powerful for what happens to most people. And when I see people get stuck or in a place that they can't, they, they're not losing weight, uh, they've got some numbers that um, teach me about what they're up to, uh, but they don't really appreciate why, why am I stalled? Why, why isn't this working? Why did I stop feeling as good as I used to? Um, and this is one of those places that's kind of a hidden part of this chemistry shift. And again, you don't have to worry about this if, if you're the first two weeks on keto. I like patients um, to steadily progress through these stages. Um, but before I introduce number nine, uh, and this will be important also when we talk about what happened to Jim, before you advance to number nine, which is a 36 hour fast, they have to have normal blood pressures. Meaning they can't be dipping down. Uh, if they're on blood pressure medications, I will have them hold the blood pressure medications during uh, step number nine. My diabetics must beware. If you are on uh, glucose lowering medications, and if you're a diabetic, you should know what those are. Metformin is not a glucose lowering medication. Now, yes, it improves glucose regulation, but it doesn't suppress it through an insulin-like uh, process. Insulin secretagogues are your glipizides, your, um, uh, they, they, they act like insulin. So if you're on insulin, a 36 hour fast, you need to be hand in hand with your physician. If you take medications that lower blood sugar through a stimulation of insulin, you need to be careful. This has to be done with your physician uh, or you're gonna hurt yourself. Uh, and I've seen that with patients who've really tried to push to the next level. Uh, and that's what this is. The next level is a 36 hour fast. I, and I, I walk people that sounds like a long time, like, oh my goodness, I can't possibly imagine that. But if you map it out and you say, okay, if you are getting to step nine, you've already figured out how to spend 23 hours of the day not eating. And this sounds really goofy to folks who have never done it, but as you become keto adapted, it is easier and easier and easier to do this. But the 36 hour fast, you can hack it a little bit that most of the time, 16 of those hours, you can spend sleeping. So you're really only saying no to food for about 20 hours. So I tell people, eat your supper, uh, get nice and full, <laughs> do not skimp on that meal, a nice satiating meal, um, uh, and then go to bed. The next morning you're gonna wake up, it is black coffee, it is water, salt only. Um, uh, those are the perfect fasts. As you've seen with Jerry and several other folks that I've guided on this show, um, we have we have exceptions. I mean, that's the perfect fast is salt and water. But adding BHB to my circulation when I'm having a crappy day and I feel yucky on a fast, um, I call it failing upwards. Sure, a, a perfect fast of salt and water would be great. But if I get close with a um, addition of some uh, uh, BHB or a little bone broth, both of those are very good. Um, it's not the perfect fast, but it's better than than, than failing, than going, than eating. So um, I really encourage you to have salt crystals in your pocket that day. If you've never done this, I'm not talking about like one or two little shakes of a salt. I'm talking about so much salt. Uh, let's see if I have a, I have. Ah, so I have this little bin that um, one of my patients gave me and it is an old salt bin. I don't know if you can see the salt in there, but I will literally, Put the salt on my tongue like that when I'm fasting because it, it flushes my mouth with uh, saliva, but at the same time, any craving for food is evaporated. But it's not just a sprinkle of salt. You need to really put salt on your tongue like that. That is what it looks like to suppress your appetite through salt. And it is super important to have that around on your first 36 hour fast. Who has a lot of salt? <laughs> mm. So the next morning you awaken. So you, you get through that whole day. Be careful, be careful to stay away from the snacking. Uh, some of the first successes that I had getting through a 72 hour fast, which is coming up, uh, was finding those things in the evening that were comforting to me, but that were not filled with temptation. Like my husband and I, I like to go to movies, but there better not be popcorn around. <laughs> I can do it now, but I couldn't do it then. I was like, oh my goodness, this is evil. I cannot do it. Um, all right, so number 10 is a 48 hour fast and then number 11 is a 72 hour fast.
Okay, so what am I telling you this for? This is this natural progression of what happens to patients when they have um, a ketogenic um, uh, chemistry that's advancing. And when they've fallen off the wagon, when things haven't gone well, I like them to look at this list and say, where did you get to? And, and you can usually find them. Some people said, I've never restricted my calories to, to eight hours a day. Um, maybe I missed a meal every once in a while, but I really was stuck between four and five. But looking to see where you can go and then careful not to jump over uh, one of these numbers because it's a chemistry set that we're working with. Each of these chemistry sets is an advancement of the previous one. And when I look at some of the, the, the best ways to like reflect on why did they fall off, what happened, I say, where did you get to? And then where do you think you should start? So if they're back to eating every two to four hours, then we, we start all the way back at the beginning. We get urine ketone strips, ketones, I call them, people call them. Um, if they say, no, I actually still eat twice a day, that pattern stuck. I'm kind of at three or four. I really eat twice a day. I just didn't, I'm not keto. Uh, and I, I'm careful to remind people that keto is not uh, a, um, is not a, uh, a keto is not a, 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 a thought. Uh, it's not a diet. It's chemistry. Like I have a 1.0 ketone on my finger tonight um, because I'm keto, I'm ke I am in ketosis. There are ketones in my circulation. So when people say I'm on the ketogenic diet, but their circulating ketones are 0.2 or 0.3, that's not the keto diet. There's something wrong with their chemistry. They're stuck at one of these levels. To get them to the next level, they first need to know that there's such a thing. And then set a goal that is stepwise. Remember, I, I mean, I try to give you plenty of real life examples that I did not do a 36 hour fast for the first nine months. My mother did 40 days of fasting and that's in the book about why she had to do that. Uh, it saved her life, it fixed her chemistry better than anything I could have prescribed her. But as I learned to go from 36 hours to 72 hours, oh my goodness, I thought the world was gonna end. It was very dramatic. <laughs> My husband's like, you need to figure that out because that's a lot. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Jim. Uh, and we're going to talk about well, just a few things to remind you of his story. Highest weight was 271. That was, I think, in his teenage years. By January of 2018, he was 223 and had not heard of keto yet. Um, or if he had, it was minimal. Him and his wife really looked into the ketogenic diet because of uh, Alzheimer's, uh, not sure if it's their family uh, personally or if it's an extended family that that was important to them. Um, Jim started out this story on four diabetic medications and his blood pressure medicines were also part of his story. As you look at some of his labs, by February of 2018, again, this is before he started keto, his hemoglobin A1C was 7.9. By the end of that year, his A1C was 6.7. What I think is even more remarkable is his wife's A1C. And again, if she's the one with the risk of Alzheimer's, that A1C of 9.1 is the greatest risk factor she has. And she dropped it all the way down to 6.9. Now, I still want to point out that an A1C of 6.7 is an average blood sugar of 161. That is still not a good idea for a healthy brain. Uh, you have, I mean, his doctor still had him on uh, uh, diabetes medications because his doctor knows that too. We have to get it down lower if you want to prevent the brain deterioration process. That is too high of a blood sugar. You will aid your brain faster. You will make neural fibril tangles. You will advance dementia quicker uh, with that high of a blood sugar. His wife's blood sugar, 246 at a 9.1. That's her average blood sugar based on the A1C. Uh, and her number got down to 168. So dramatic improvement. There is not a medication out there that can get that good of a response in that short of a time. It has to become a behavior change in the way you eat. So praise for them doing that well. Uh, but if you read the rest of Jim's story, uh, he was doing great on one meal a day. So if you remember our little list, that's where he was. <laughs> he says he broke the one uh, tenth of a ton, which is 200 pounds for the first time in over 50 years uh, in July of 2019. That is such a big moment. 
He went on to continue to lose weight, was down to um, 191 by August of um, that year, of this year, just a few months ago. And then he decided to do his first 36 hour fast. He was like, this shouldn't be hard. I already do one meal a day, but I'm gonna bet his one meal a day was not what I would recommend to my, uh, the people under my care. Uh, and he'd been doing this for a couple of weeks, which I would say I would stick patients to that one meal a day and then tighten up the parameters for one meal a day for like a six week period before I'd push them to do 36 hour fast. But he did it and at about two o'clock in the morning, 30 hours into his fast, the EMTs pick him up off the living room floor and took him to Mercy Hospital in Springfield, Missouri. <laughs> oh my goodness. So he uh, goes on to write about um, that, that they officially diagnosed him with low blood pressure and dehydration. Um, and that he says, you know, doc, I have quite a problem. I'm gonna actually pop out of here and do um, some, uh, this one right here. Uh, so he says, you know, doc, this isn't uh, the first time that I've, um, you know, changed medications. My doctor's been working with me. But uh, as I showed up to ask them about the ketogenic diet, I was very thankful that um, they didn't, my endocrinologist did not say no. My, um, my, uh, um, uh, what the, his primary care did not say no. They both said that they, he could do the ketogenic diet. Um, and when he had a syncopal event, which is a, he passed out, um, he really, really got them scared. Uh, and the doctor changed the rules on him. And this is the part where uh, I'm gonna read from, if I can find this in here, uh, hold on here. Mm -hmm. Let's see, where did I put that document? Here we go. Okay, uh, so yeah, okay. Thank you for just letting me find that little piece of uh, information. So he says that um, I, uh, let's go back to, so he had, um, okay. So he, he went into the ER, they pumped him full of fluids. I think he gained like 11 pounds in uh, a two day period because of the fluids and the sugar water and a whole bunch of things that reversed it. Um, and it did scare. I mean, you wake up on the floor not knowing what happened. <laughs> you talk about, we're trying to prevent brain injuries here, not make them uh, suddenly much worse. Um, they did stop his blood pressure medicine. That's actually very important. And he is much better about drinking liquid. Uh, I would contend that when you're, when you're on the ketogenic diet, um, it's, it's hard to say this to folks in general, but when I have them on medications that lower blood pressure or cause them to, to urinate out, their sense of thirst changes over time. When I get them back to normal, I find satisfying their thirst if they can uh, look at that in a way that's not just a checklist, but really listening to their system. Using the salt uh, is very powerful for suppressing appetite, but that salted water also keeps the fluid inside the veins and arteries better than just plain water. When he went into the doctor's office for after passing out, he said, oh, um, they, they put it, the salted water right in my veins because that's what they're doing is they're trying to expand the volume of fluid inside his veins. All right, so here's the part that's interesting. So my wife and I um, uh, said, okay, we're still gonna do two meals a day. So if you remember on our little checklist, that's about number four. We're still gonna do two meals a day, um, but the goal from their medical team was about 130 grams of fat and 40 carbohydrates per day. He had his foracare, he was checking his fingers. Multiple times a day, he had looked at his numbers. He'd had ketones as high as 2.4 with a Dr. Boz ratio of 62 or 55 or some of, his, some of his numbers before he passed out. Using that 40 carbohydrates a day guideline, which I think it's, it's not fair to say that to him because how many carbohydrates can your body handle? I don't know, check. And what he says is, I did this rule that my, my uh, doctor wants me to do, which is take those 40 carbs in a day, and now I can't seem to get a ketone reading above 0.5. I've stopped losing weight. Um, my average blood sugars over the last um, uh, 30, day is, 30 days is about 
145, and if you remember those A1C is what he's getting that off of, it's not bad. It's way better than he was. But if he wants to continue the progression, we have to continue to follow the chemistry, not just a guideline that uh, they're guessing. How many carbohydrates can he handle a day? Clearly 40 is too much for this man. Uh, his morning fasting sugars have gone up. His ketones have all but disappeared. He is not on the ketogenic diet. I know he's eating high fat with low carb, but keto diet is a chemistry. And when you are not in the chemistry, it doesn't give you the benefits. His brain will continue to slow down. If he wants to reverse that brain risk, we have to get him in a Dr. Boz ratio of 80 or less for sure. Uh, and that means he's gonna need to lower those carbs. So I would be happy to talk to Jim's doctor and just talk him through that. Um, it is not something that is an easy conversation for patients to have. Uh, but um, I also think uh, if, if you uh, watch what we could do to prevent that uh, dehydration and that syncopal event, it is that he goes back to that one meal a day uh, and he cleans it up. Uh, so instead of two meals a day, he's gonna do one meal a day. Maybe he makes a compromise with his doctor that he can have 40 grams of carbohydrates in one meal. I still think that's gonna be too much for him based on my experience with 20 years of diabetes, uh, diabetic patients. Um, but I think uh, cleaning up to, the, to keeping it in that morning window, not having any of those calories come in later in the day is gonna be really important for him to take. Uh, he didn't necessarily fall off the bandwagon, he's just fallen off getting any good results. All right, so let's, uh, let's move over to um, uh, our, let's see here, I want to go to this one. We're gonna finish our story um, with, uh, <laughs> okay, so, um, yes, this is our gal from Alabama. So our Nana from Alabama. I am going to um, read a little bit more of her story and then I will show you uh, uh, what she sent in, which is super fun to watch uh, her numbers because I have a nice little chart. She's like definitely a firstborn female <laughs> where she plots everything. She is uh, on top of this. I'm going to read about her story and you'll, you'll see her firstborn uh, tendencies. She's got these grandkids. She wants to be Mary Poppins by saying, yep, my health is really important to me and I, um, I've, I've, I'm struggling. Uh, so she said, yep, I've struggled with my weight my whole life. M mainly 10 pounds down is what I would get. In July of 2017, um, she was at 220 po or 212 pounds with a 44-inch weight weight <laughs> waist circumference, excuse me. Um, and then that's when she found keto. Uh, she dug in, she read, she listened, she studied, uh, and she kept her carbs under 20. Uh, she says more, more like 15 is where she would be at. She plotted it all out. She even, she even measured calories, 1,400 to 1,500 calories, 90 to 100 grams of protein. Fat was between 130 and 150, and she lost 30 pounds in eight months, the first time she's been successful at weight loss in a long time. So by March of 2018, she stalled. Uh, I've tried to change my weight. I've adjusted my protein, taken it up, taken it down. Uh, I've adjusted my fat up and down. I've tried intermittent fasting. <laughs> I've tried one OMAD. Um, and she's also, um, she even got a continuous glucose monitor, which watches the sugar all day long. And she's like, yep, uh, I could see a spike every morning at about 8 a.m. This was prior to eating or drinking. So this is me saying your system is over plunged. You have held on to weight for so long that your stored sugar called glycogen is giving you a meal every morning at eight o'clock, but you don't get to count it. Meaning you're not eating anything. There's just so much sugar present that it's like eating. You should think of it as eating. Um, so she goes, I tried carnivore. Um, and then she's attached a copy of her um, her labs, and that's what I want to show you, or her, her progress. She says, I've done some 36-hour fasts. I have had no weight loss since March of 2018. Uh, I really need some help here. Um, I've been using some of the, you know, she watches the show. She's looking for some instruction. So let's see if I can make, make this work. Uh, give me just a second. 
Uh, so Nana's Labs. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to happen. Okay. So if you look here, uh, this started on November 4th, and she's at one meal for lunch. Her sugars at 8 o'clock in the morning, her glucose right there is 104. By 2 o'clock, it's 101. And by 6.30 at night, it's 98. She has ketones above 0.5, so even though she hasn't lost weight in a year and a half, uh, she is in ketosis. What isn't right yet is she's not in, um, I mean, she has actually a good ratio there. 78 is below 80, that's where weight loss should come. Um, but each morning she ticks up, so there's the next day. She's got a Friday, which was a um, morning sugar of 108, uh, noon sugar of 109, 330, it's still 113, all of those, never should your sugar be above 100. I know mine was just above 100 a minute ago, <laughs> so do as I say, not as I do. Uh, but for, for weight loss purposes, most of the time the sugars need to be under 100 or, or low enough that either you get ketones like that 1.8 with a glucose of 50, that's a good number. Why was it so great? Because she'd had an active day. She was using the fuel of glucose and she was producing ketones and she probably felt good. Um, here she does a 30 hour fast. It starts out with a glucose of 105 and a ketone of 0.3. Her Dr. Bob's ratio is over 300. She is not gonna have weight loss that day. It is going to be difficult to see that. So you say, well, um, but boy, by two o'clock that afternoon, she's got ketones of 1.2. Now her sugar goes down to 90 um, and ketones are still pretty strong. Uh, she wakes up the next morning and she's popped that sugar back up to 114, but her ketones are only, I mean, are 0.9. That's great. Yesterday, I mean, she started only at 0.3 the day before. So she goes back to one meal a day at lunchtime, again, falling into that pretty clean morning routine. Um, and you look at um, sugars the next day. So what's always interesting to me is to watch when you do a fast, what happens the next couple of days? Because uh, her, it's why we really want you to not binge when you stop a fast. To eat a whole bunch of sugar after you stopped a fast means you just filled up that glycogen again. Don't do that, don't do that. Eat sardines. <laughs> All right, so just continuing on here, she has several examples where the that Dr. Bob's ratio is over 300 first thing in the morning. Um, um, at least the, you know, here a ketone number of 0.6. First of all, you just need to praise this woman for doing such a great job of documenting. Uh, as she sends this in and says, what would you do? Um, almost always, I have to say, that I got to have the data to know, to be able to help you. Um, and I, I am not adding any patience until I finish this book. <laughs> uh, and then I, I, I still, I want to, I, I want to help a lot of people. Uh, so that means things like this, where I use a story to say, how could I help her by teaching her physician, teaching her, um, she's a smart woman. Look at this. She's amazing. Uh, but look at all of those sugars are above a hundred. Oh, no, there's 96. My bad. Um, again, above 100, above 100. So now you get another 30 hour fast and that's where you can see these sugars go down and ketones rise. Uh, it looks to me like the next morning, uh, which is probably when she started to eat, um, that sugar went up to 118. Um, ketones 0.6, always after her fast for at least a day, she has pretty solid ketone production. But I would contend that most of these Dr. Bob's ratios are too high to lose weight. And she is proving that by documenting her weight all the way along here. Uh, so you say, well, what would you do? What would you do? I'm going to show you a couple other things because um, I, I do think this is a powerful teaching moment. Just every one of these morning sugars is above 100. So I'm just going to check. There's one above 100, above 100, above 100, above 100. Every morning fasting sugar is above 100. This is not good. If your morning fasting sugar is above 100, okay, pay attention to this. Um, all right, so here is uh, her labs. And I wanted to show you a couple things. Um, first of all, do you see where it says hemoglobin A1C there in the green? And it says 5.6, and they call that normal. But that is an average sugar of 122. So even though she says, I'm not diabetic, I don't need any meds, I'm okay. Um, if you go backwards in time, in 2017, her, her sugar was, uh, her A1C was 5.9, which is an average sugar of 132. Again, this hemoglobin A1C, these are red blood cells that float around your body. They last 100 days or about three months in our circulation. And when there's sugar around them, they get stickier. 
How sticky is your red blood cell? Oh, that's what your hemoglobin A1C tells me. If your hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C is 5.6, you had 122 glucose molecules swirling around those red blood cells. So some other things that made me concerned about her numbers was her uric acid is very high. Uh, this is not because she eats too much meat. This is another process of inflammatory um, milieu, like proteins and uh, cytokines and crystallization of, uh, of, of nitrogen, uh, watching it find new places to deposit, which happen to be in our joints. Um, she, that's a lot of uric acid. That has to be lower. That has to get down. Like I would want your, your uric acid at least between two and four. Um, you know, I know it says three to four, but it, you want that as low as you can get it. Like a two to three is great. Even a 1.5 is great. Because what it says is that your inflammatory markers are less. So that, that's one tickle of a hint that um, I would, when I was looking at her numbers. But the other thing that I would be super curious about, or I want her to see, um, is going all the way down here. Uh, so she, the doc did a good job of checking iron. So her ferritin is 121. The danger of ferritin is if you get a big bruise, your body has inflammation. It's an acute inflammation, meaning a recent inflammation. If I give you sutures, if, I, if you come in and you cut your finger and I gotta sew you, so put some sutures in your, in your, in your cut, uh, that ferritin will go up. It reacts to recent trauma or recent damage. Uh, her, her ferritin of 121, that's a good number, and you'd think, oh, it's above 50, she's doing great. But I wonder if that's more related to an inflammatory marker because the uric acid is high, and what made me concerned was uh, that her, oof, duh, hang in there, it's way down here. Uh, we'll come back to triglycerides in just a second. Her total uh, iron saturation, yes. Iron saturation was down to 17. That is definitely on the low side. I know it says normal, but you shouldn't have that much. Ferritin is the protein that's hopping around your body. And it says that 17% of the seats on the ferritin bus, ferritin carries iron, 17% of the seats have iron in them. That's really low. Uh, you, you, you should have some liver. <laughs> uh, liver is a great way to get the iron up. It's also great keto. Uh, so Braunschweiger is really good. I'm sure if you uh, uh, grew up on a farm, you know exactly what I'm talking about there. I do want to point out that I am not at all concerned about her cholesterol in looking at her LDL or her total cholesterol. But I what her it was her triglycerides that got my attention a little bit. I love those triglycerides to be under 100. Uh, in October of 2019, she's been on the keto diet for a couple of years. The way triglycerides are made is she still has enough carbohydrates or enough glucose in circulation that she is turning them into triglycerides. So to look at that process of the, of the fats going out, we'd love to keep them where they were before that, which is in May, they were 75. Way back in 2011, they were 60. Um, in 2017, they were 106 like this. So it, it makes me say there's somewhere, there's carbohydrates coming in or we might have to use a medication to help her out. Um, let's see, I wanted to go to the last thing down here was her highly sensitive C-reactive protein. This is a big deal. So the other thing about Nana from Alabama is her highly sensitive C-reactive protein. So C-reactive protein is a marker of inflammation that if you were looking down the tunnel of your artery, there's actually a lining of skin on the inside of that artery and when that skin lining gets inflamed, it predicts a heart attack. Uh, we don't want that. We do not want this inflamed. Now, it's different than the CRP. Uh, that, that's a huge conglomerate. We're looking very specifically at this micro uh, protein called highly sensitive C-reactive protein. And so it's very sensitive, the, the test measurement is. So she's got the right test. It should be less than one. And she's at almost 10. She has a 10 times risk. This is just in October from two months ago, two months ago, uh, 10 times risk of a heart attack. She needs to cut uh, these numbers down in a hurry. Uh, the last thing I want to point out is Alabama is a lot closer to the equator than South Dakota, and her vitamin D is dismal, 24. She needs to 
do some belly dancing in the sun. I, she needs to expose her skin to the sun during the short shadow times. Um, I'll tell you, my dad, <laughs> the way I fix this in him was I sent him to a tanning bed that had UVA and UVB rays. Um, he just, he's an old farmer that wears long sleeves and long pants. I couldn't change that, but I did talk him into going to a, a tanning bed. So you look at all of these numbers and you say, well, what would I do in the case of, uh, uh, of, uh, here we go. <laughs> what would I do in the case of Nana? Let's turn this off. Let's go back here. Uh, you know, you, you look at her story uh, and say she has, uh, first of all, she's done a great job. She is um, uh, continuing on the ketogenic diet for a, a year and a half without weight loss. So you, you want to know why people fall off is they aren't able to shift their chemistry in a way that gives them the rewards. When they feel good, that improvement in their body uh, keeps them on the ketogenic way of living. Uh, this is a chemistry set though. And if the chemistry isn't right, we need to help Nana and Jim improve their chemistry. Now, Jim has a physician who's working hard on, on the, all the right things. Um, I would encourage Jim to, to watch those videos about Jerry where we came up with looking at his sugars, he, uh, Jerry should have a meal every 48 hours. Uh, and you know, Jerry works closely with me to make sure that he, he's doing that. And Jerry's human. He can do it for a while and then he just, there's too much social pressure to go that long without a meal. But he goes back to the one meal a day, keeping all the calories in the 23 hours. The thing I would do with Nana is um, I, I need her to get her head around this. So uh, she's doing a great job. Uh, however, uh, cleaning up the hours of the day that she allows food in uh, needs to go to that 23 and 1. Um, her morning fasting sugars uh, are too high. Um, I, I look at the Fs that come with uh, uh, predicting who has high insulin. This was way back from medical school, but I still think of it every time when I'm saying, is she at risk? She has the Fs. She's female. She's fertile. She's had children. She's over 40. Uh, she's overweight. <laughs> uh, and there's uh, one more. Oh, uh, it can have bowel. I don't know about her bowel stories. But anyway, she's got plenty of risk factors. And then she has the labs to show me that she is definitely insulin resistant. Her insulin is high. She needs to stop stimulating insulin. So that means that 23 hours of her day should be spent without calories. Now, she might not get there tomorrow. So as she works towards that, what I have done with my patients in the last six months is put BHB into the plan. And I don't mean a little bit of it. Uh, I know the capsules are really uh, attractive to people and people like to do that because there's no sugar substitute in them. But the highest return on your investment is BHB in this canister where there's no fat in it. Uh, we don't need to, um, and like tonight I took uh, the, the BHB with MCT and I've not had very much to drink so I don't know how this is going to turn out on my numbers. but. Hmm. But I started out keto adapted. My ketone production is strong. When you look at N Nana from Alabama, her ketone production is pretty good. Within, within that 30 hour fast, you can see her mitochondria start to produce ketones. So um, if she has uh, just straight B B BHB at home, I, I would totally be putting that in the 23 hours. Again, fail upwards. Uh, the 23 hours spent uh, in uh, the calorie free zone she's not gonna wake up tomorrow calorie free for 23 hours. It is a skill that you learn. And as you walk through, uh, I'll, I'll quickly put these back up just so you can see them. As you walk through um, this list, ah, I don't want that to be there anymore. Hmm. Let's see if I can get it to go. It's not liking that. Oh, I, Okay, it's not bringing it up, but hopefully it will in a minute here. Uh, as you look through the list that I had up earlier, <laughs> which are those uh, 14 steps of where are you at in your progression, as I look at uh, Nana from Alabama, she has done a lot of things right. She gets through a 30 hour fast pretty well, uh, but I would bet that her one meal a day sh could be cleaned up. Uh, start with the eight hours of saying 16 and eight, but it is strict. Your, uh, your eight hours that you eat in, I would, I would include your, uh, your, your cortisol as your beginning timer. 
That means that you wake up every morning with those high sugars because your brain is connected to the sun and the sun will signal the production of cortisol to talk to your liver to say, hey, our little human being is going to wake up and they need energy. Uh, in order to give them the energy they require, let's release some of the stored sugar. Uh, that stored sugar doesn't show up in a heartbeat. It shows up um, for the next couple of hours. And that's where that five o'clock is when the spike happens where your brain talks to your, your liver, but it really keeps your sugars high for the next hour or two. I mean, probably four or five hours. That's like a meal. That's exactly what a meal does. And that's not normal. That's what happens when you've been overweight for a long period of time. Uh, to reverse her risk of heart disease, to get that hemoglobin A1C, I like my hemoglobin A1C to be close to four. 4.0. Yes, that's a blood sugar that's normal. And when I know that lab test says that it's normal, but you want that blood sugar even lower than it is. Do not feel safe uh, with a blood sugar of 122 or 136. There's lots of things going on in the background, and you can see that in her labs with the uric acid and with that highly sensitive C-reactor protein. Finally, I would ask Nana to consider, I would ask her to go to her doctor and say, I know you're not on medications and you haven't been for a while, but metformin does a really good job of improving the chemistry uh, of taking the blood sugar and helping your system use it more efficiently because it's lingering outside the cells way too long. And as much as people don't like to take uh, prescription medications, that's kind of an identity thing maybe even for her where she's, you know, able to stay off medications, nice low blood sugars, blood pressures. Um, but in the, in the end, I would, I would push her to say, uh, wouldn't, um, wouldn't it be okay if, oh, I don't think all of those are going to fit on there. Let's see if I can make that a little bit better. There we go, almost. So those are, those are the um, 11 steps that I like for patients to look at is, th is this, if you wanna take a quick screenshot of that, look where you're at, ask yourself honestly, where, do you, where should you be? Uh, and finally, uh, use that as a guide to say, if you've fallen off the wagon, uh, don't think of it as uh, just kind of a, a, a style of, of eating. Think of it as, did it result in the chemistry shift that you needed? Uh, as you can see in the show notes below, I have a strong um, 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 opinions about what should go into my patients. Uh, I did uh, put um, several of these products out on the market, and recently you guys have left reviews on Amazon for me. Thank you so much. It supports this channel to try and continue to work on delivering a message for you guys. And um, again, I apologize for that uh, delay earlier tonight. Um, I am gonna check my sugars as I wind up a couple of things. Uh, when it comes to um, the new year, I would love it if you uh, shared with me uh, what number you're at on that progression. And if you think you can set a goal of having one of the other uh, progressions, one of the other um, lists uh, in the next, you set yourself a goal. Could you, can you do that in, uh, 48 hours, can you, or I mean, four months, can you get uh, to that next layer in uh, two months? If you're looking for the class that I am trying to organize and teach, I'm trying to get that out by the end of the first quarter. Uh, so watch for that. I don't have any way to sign up for it yet. Just kind of stay tuned. Uh, I am going to check my numbers here at the end of the show and see how I did. Uh, it always feels like a marathon for me. Uh, oh, look at that. I totally use my sugar. Uh, so glucose uh, is 85. We're still counting down on those ketones. Uh, and if you look uh, each week, I am 1.4 on the ketone. So yeah, that, that ketone went up because of the supplement. My body used the sugar after I stressed out and did what I did at the beginning of the video. Uh, looking at that progression though, this is showing you I'm in ketosis. I am it's a chemistry process. Uh, when you look at somebody with the amazing amount of data that uh, Nana from Alabama sent in, uh, she has all the tools there in front of her. Uh, some of the things that I've done to help patients along the way is uh, she's very adapted in what she eats. Uh, the food guides that I have on my website uh, are little bitty tricks to say, you're not gonna wake up tomorrow perfect. She's not gonna be great at keeping those 23 hours perfect tomorrow. Uh, neither will Jim. As he looks at uh, going back into his doctor and saying, can I negotiate one meal a day? Can we take the 40 down to 30? And maybe step through those next steps 
to get his, uh, the carbohydrates will, his chemistry will show him what is the right dose for him. Uh, as Nana continues her progression in how do you clean up 23 hours, fail upwards, put ketones in the circulation and get your mitochondria used to using them. Uh, I have a lecture coming up and one of the chapters in the book is about how many uh, places a ketone body, BHB is a ketone body, uh, uh, is a signaling agent. Much like insulin uh, tells uh, sugars to get stored, insulin insulates us, it gets the sugars out of circulation and into storage. It's also a growth hormone. It's really gnarly for that uh, risk of heart disease and brain disease. Um, it is a signaling agent. It sends messages besides just lower the blood sugar. BHB is a signaling agent as well. So just having it in circulation is an amazing appetite suppressant. It is, um, I mean, that is why Grandma Rose had such rejuvenation of her system. Uh, she had ketones floating around. Now she fasted for 40 days. <laughs> she was amazing. Uh, but had I known what I know now, I would have said, I would have started ketone supplements much earlier and I would have made her check that ratio every day uh, in hopes that we wouldn't have had the crisis we had leading to her colostomy bag. All right, guys, uh, once again, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for this channel. There's a few things I ask for each week, and that is if you haven't left a review for any way you can, it's the only way that message gets out is that folks leave review. Uh, I'm writing another book, and so I'm hoping that uh, uh, to have your support in uh, just uh, continuing to show up every Sunday, pass this to the people who you think it could help their health, uh, and um, yeah, pray for me to finish this book. Um, I am Dr. Boz signing off for the week, improving your health one ketone at a time. We'll see you next Sunday, everybody.